This episode is brought to you by Portland Distro. If you love underground music and movies, go to portlanddistro.com for licensed shirts, vinyl, CDs, and more. Go to portlanddistro.com. Hey everyone, welcome to Road to Ruin 4, the show that I do with my good friend Randy Larson. And uh, for those of you out there who have listened to Metal Matters, uh, the former podcast uh, that I did for a couple of years, Randy has been my co-host on that, as well as some choice episodes of this very podcast, the overarching Everything Went Black podcast network. Randy's been on that a bunch of times. So uh, thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, it's been it's been cool doing these every week, um, You know, doing the stuff with Randy every month. But this episode's actually a special episode. Uh, we have our good friend, Jeff Kashid, one of the founding members of ISIS, arguably one of the most important bands to come out of the 90s in the underground metal, hardcore. I know they, they called them uh, you know, like post-metal or post-rock or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, they have their own style. They created their own thing. I mean, obviously, there is... Um, you know, some very heavy influences by some of my favorite bands, Swans, Neurosis, Godflesh. But they definitely crafted their own sound out of a lot of the building blocks that I actually feel that I've been influenced by as well in the uh, gem- genesis of Tombs, my own band. But anyway, Randy, Jeff, and I have been friends for a quarter of a century. And this was the first time that the three of us have actually been in a room together in person for quite a while. You know, Jeff lives on the West Coast in L.A. Randy lives in Connecticut. I live in the Garden State, New Jersey. Randy and I have, uh, you know, due to proximity, have been able to get together pretty frequently. But it's, uh, it's a very rare occasion when Jeff joins us in person. Jeff is also... One of the co-hosts of my horror podcast that I do with Mike Scandato, Necromaniacs. So it was a really cool time. We got together. We had fun. We talked about uh, ISIS, the band, not the uh, terrorist organization. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is just the result of that. Uh, you know, three really good friends hanging out. Uh, one of them, one of us, who is actually uh, sort of famous, I guess, in some ways. Um, in certain circles, that is. And uh, yeah, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of fun, and it was a good time, and I hope you all enjoy this episode. So Jeff, uh, we asked you on here because you were one of the founding members of a band that actually turned out to be very uh, important in the this, in this scheme of uh, certain offshoots of extreme music. And of course, we're talking about um, ISIS, the band ISIS, not the uh, terrorist group ISIS. <laughs> Although also important. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and influential in, in the metal community. Yeah. Hey, actually, since we're talking about that, uh, how did did that affect you guys at all? Like when all that stuff happened? I mean, I, there was a moment where I was where, where I was a little bit scared, like where Aaron Harris like called me and was like, or, or you know, it was an email. It was like, you know, ABC is going to do a, you know, an online story about, you know, the band getting mistaken for the terrorist group or like our fa- getting like weird messages on Facebook. And I was like, oh, man, who cares? No one's going to give a shit about that. And like the next day, Monday morning, like the wacky K-Rock radio DJs are like talking about it. Wow. And uh, the day after that, they're doing a schedule. I heard about this band, ISIS. Well, we got the guitar player Luke McCool online and they're doing like a whole sketch about it. Really? Yeah. I had no I mean, idea. Yeah, man. it was crazy. Like, I was listening to it. Um, yeah, Kevin and Bean in the morning. It was like one of the biggest morning radio shows ever. And uh, like, oh, we got a snippet of their music. And they and they played like, I don't know, maybe like 15, 20 seconds of uh, Hall of the Dead, the first song off Wade and Radiant. And when they stopped it, it was like a, a slight pause. And like, oh, well, oh, that's not for me. <laughs> like they were just, they were basically just shit on us. Damn. But uh, uh, I ended up tweeting about it, and they liked it. Like they were like, "Oh, you know," uh, I, I t- tweeted at the guy who did did the the parody or whatever, and he liked it. You know, I guess. Did he go down there with like a crowbar and like I, smash heads? You know, I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, if it was happening to anyone else, I would think it's funny. So, 
Uh, but no, like I, I never felt like I was in danger or anything like that. Did they try to frame it like you guys like, you know, came came along upon that name after? No, no but like I think some people probably did uh, think that because there were comments or like, who the fuck would name their band ISIS? You know. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think there are people out there that uh, aren't aware that ISIS like is a, a fucking Egyptian like mythology mythological yeah, figure? Uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. When we reunited for that one show in 2018, you know, there's a reason we, we didn't play under the name ISIS. Damn. And, uh, I mean, it was for a million reasons. <laughs> I'm sure you know the more obvious is some guy, in a, you know, drives by and sees ISIS on a marquee, you know, like, hell, oh, not in my fucking town. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you know, with that, that you have to be, we had to be conscious of that. Damn. Yeah. That's, Damn. I mean, because, like, you know, I obviously I don't. I don't. I see the two things is completely different, you know. And I yeah. also think even even the term ISIS is like that's some made up like Western shit. That's not even what the terrorists call themselves. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, yeah, it, it's what are the fucking chances that we start this band in 1997, and when when did uh, 2000, like 13, 14, like, like years after we had broken up, like it, it becomes this thing. It's a good thing it happened when you guys had broken up, though. Yeah, I think we all definitely said that. We would have been completely fucked had we, like, stayed together or were together and that was going on at that point. Like, it would have been, it would have been bad. We'd have to change the name. Yeah, probably, right? And how do you, how do you change your name, like, that far into your you know, career? It's just, that's never a good sign. Like, when the bad brains became the soul brains. <laughs> like, yeah. When, <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, like everything else, you know, eventually people stopped giving a shit and moved on and the whole joke about who you know I, I can't wear my isis shirt like uh, okay great you know yeah actually i have i have like a this isis hoodie you should that wear it literally all it says on it is ISIS. <laughs> it's like a zip up hoodie it just says in these big letters isis yeah, I, like, yeah. Damn, I wonder i should I, I i always think about wearing it though but i'm like i don't know man people will probably get sensitive about it you guys still have like an active merch store. I just checked the other day, and oh. all the uh, merch, oh, do we? <laughs> all the merch that's up there now, it doesn't say ISIS on any of it. It's just more like imagery yeah. and stuff like album titles and stuff like that, which is cool. Because yeah, I have like probably uh, thirty ISIS shirts. Yeah, yeah, me too. I got tons. You know, I can't. I just stickers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. everything like that. So that is weird. But um, so we should let's say a little bit how we met because we've all known each other for. A long time yeah here. yeah definitely um, um yeah. me and jeff go back you guys go way back to 1993 yeah. actually september 18th 1990 you know the exact date i do because we met each other got introduced at a fugazi show at yukon fugazi and shutter to think and mi6, and MI6 yeah. which was a local <laughs> band uh from connecticut i like shutter to think better than fugazi a, a hard agree <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> me too although i like fugazi i love shutter to think yeah. So we got introduced through like mutual friends at that show. So, you know, and then me and Jeff played in a band together, an irrelevant band. No, we, no, 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 no. Say who it is. Uh, this band called Structure. Okay. Which no one will know who that is. All right. That's fine. Uh, which was very short lived. Um, but your tenure in the band was very short lived. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> the band was terrible. Yeah, it so. was bad. <laughs> um, and, you know, and that, that kind of turned into what became. Cable, because the drummer, Vic, Jeff was playing bass, and I was playing guitar in that band structure, and that, a little bit down the line, that turned into Cable, but yeah, me and Jeff go back to uh, September 18th, 1993, so um, how did you and Jeff meet for the first time? I was in this band in Boston that used to be a rock band that sounded like Alice in Chains, and then they had a blonde singer. And then they decided that they wanted to uh, become a hardcore band again because yeah, it was guys that were in Wrecking Crew. Well, guys that, that were in Wrecking Crew towards the end. They weren't even really Wrecking Crew guys. Like mm -hmm. one guy was like the singer at the end. One guy was the guitar player at the end. And um, my, my uh, you know, band had broken up and uh, they were like, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're going to try to like do something that's like ripping off Dead Guy because they had just gone on tour with Dead Guy on Bloodlet. And uh, and they were like, all right, we want we want people to like us, so we want to do this. We want to change styles again, and become this other thing. So they asked me to play, and then uh, Jeff. They found someone. Someone was like Matt Firestorm. 
Or yeah. Firestorm. My, <laughs> Firestorm. <laughs> yeah. Was like, oh, there's a guy that, you know, we, we, we want to want. Because the, the bass player that was in this version of the band was moving to California. So he, I don't think he would have been on board with doing what we were doing anyway or trying to do. And, uh, and then Jeff was introduced to the guitar player, Dean. Dean Bottolonis, by the way. His name is Dean, Dean yep. Bottolonis. Uh, he's the guy who um, was introduced to Jeff, and he told me that he was in Cable. And I was like, yeah, Cable's sick, man. It sounds great. We'll put together this whole other thing with a different bass player. And that's how Jeff and I met. Uh, and then we started, you know, we jammed together a few times. Yeah. I, my tenure in that band was shorter than yours, even. Yeah, it was just a flash. Because, like, you know, it never really went anywhere. Yeah. I would play a handful of shows. And then those guys wanted to change into this other thing to catch the next wave of post-hardcore. Yeah. You know, looking to try to latch on to some other style of music to get some kind of success. And they started another band. Uh <coughs> called The World Is My Fuse, which oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think that really went anywhere either. And I played bass in that band, actually. For, oh, did you? I, yeah. Oh, wait. Yeah. I think I saw you guys once. Yeah, yeah. I, I forgot who we played with, but it was like... It's at the Middle East. Yeah, it was some show, um, probably some emo band or something like that. Yeah, probably. I was, but I was never a, f- a full, like, official member, because we, we were all friends at that point. I was living at 30 at Calumet. You know, the, oh, the infamous 38. Yeah, I lived around the corner from you guys at yeah. the Hydrahead House, and, 91 Hillside. Yep. Oh, I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> well, fuck it, I don't live there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the infamy of 38 Calumet extended past my time living there, too. That was like the Papalardo and those guys. Oh, like they Before, were, during, and after, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, yeah for sure. I, but I mean, like that was, it extended years. That was the uh, the Yankee Sucks guys. Like, oh, yeah. The whole, the, when all the straight edge guys started doing drugs and yeah. <laughs> got involved in like some whatever fool, tomfoolery they were doing that gave them this like, you know, selling drugs. I don't know what they were doing. There. Yeah, things got weird for a while. Yeah, Papalardo was on the show. We talked about that. So, yeah. Oh, I got to listen can, to that. You can go back to like a few years ago and me, me and Anthony talk about it. Yeah, me and Anthony got, we didn't get into it, but like uh, I, I, they, those In My Eyes guys were hanging out in front of uh, Newberry Comics one day and I was wearing an engine kit shirt and I was cool with Jeff from In My Eyes because he was dating my friend Kristen and I think it was Sweet Peter Anthony said to me, he's like, oh, you're the guy who bought that record. And, <laughs> And uh, we were like, what do you mean? Like, no one bought Like, that was like the worst selling Revelation record. And I was like, I, I don't care. This band's fucking awesome. <laughs> and they were just, I don't know, like, who, who, Revolution's a hardcore label. They were just kind of being dicks. I remember that. But um, anyway, back to what we were saying. Uh, you guys met from me because when I joined uh, that band, are we not saying the name? You can say it. Big Block? Yeah, 44 Big, Big Block, yeah. Uh, I needed my bass amp back, and Randy had it. And you drove me to Randy's mom's house to 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 get that's the, right that bass amp, the the PV head, and what it was a what, what cab was that? Uh, it was one of those Mesa two fifteen cabs. What is that? Yeah. Yeah, because that that that's funny. That head had turned up years later. You had shot me a text. You yep. were somewhere. Yeah. Some studio or something. We were recording uh, the the, uh, the Bowie cover at my friend Tim's studio, and and I was going to put the bass down because it was it was just me and Andrew doing the recording, and um I'm like holy shit that's just bass head, and that's <laughs> yeah, when I, I that, uh, yeah today's the day aliens yep right yeah. yeah right yeah and it was like I was like damn this is like insane it's still it, as far as I know it's still in Boston oh actually no. Tim relocated to Arizona, so that head most likely is in his studio in Arizona. I want that head back if you're listening. <laughs> uh, it's funny to think that no one, no one probably actually paid any money for that head. You no, know what I mean, I didn't. no. <laughs> Whoever bought it originally, brand new, and then someone like twenty five dollars probably exchanged hands somewhere along the way. Yeah, uh, maybe. But yeah, yeah. I mean, Jeff's half right, as usual, with his story. Like me and you had met before. Though. Yeah. But not properly. No, not so, not formally. I know he loves to take credit for this. Yeah. So we'll let him have half of it. But uh, you know, just we're going to talk about Wavering Radiant, but that's not all we're going to talk about. Sure. You know, because we all go back a long way. So just to tie it up to like, I think want to hear a little bit about the formation of, of ISIS as well. Mm. Um, me and Jeff were in Cable. After some time, Jeff left Cable, 
I continued on. Jeff moved to Boston, which is obviously where you guys met. Yeah, that's where we met. Played in bands together up there. Um, but then ISIS formed. So, and I know you had a hand in Aaron Harris, introducing Aaron Harris. Yeah, because um, I was working with Aaron at the warehouse in Newberry Comics, and uh, that was like, you know, back then, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how it is now, but back then, that was like the rock and roll uh, job to have, where like, the, everyone that worked at the warehouse was in bands, basically, yeah, yeah. And I think, because you couldn't really get fired from that place. <laughs> yeah, believe me, they didn't fire me, and I was a horrible employee. Like, you, you had to like, steal, or like, show up and fight people you had to like <laughs> get in a fist fight with somebody to actually get fired like you could just not show up for work and like you know but i mean if, in all honesty that gig was if you're in a band that toured that was actually a pretty good gig to have really, for sure in, yeah. the, in the 90s at least yeah. i don't know how they probably change things nowadays because they're a, a bigger operation i think mm. but um yeah you could take as much time off as you wanted you had benefits you know the the pay was like whatever it was it's still you know, I mean, you could have done worse, but you could have done better. Mm, you know? Yeah. Um. So yeah, I Aaron Harris I'd known prior to that because he was in this band Loga. Yeah. And um, my old band uh, Otis had played with them, and Aaron was still in high school when we met. And um. Yeah, yeah he's the youngest member of the band. Yeah. Yeah. And there was this whole thing with uh, Loga moving to Boston, and because Sean and um. The, the bass player Ian were going to Mass Art, and but that that's kind of like where the the sort of discord started, I think, where like those dudes wanted to become artists, yeah, and Aaron wanted to be a musician, mm -hmm. and coming to Boston was like, you know, how like he wanted to get away from Maine and be in a more creative environment to pursue his ideas of music, you know, and be having a career, mm -hmm. and that's when you guys were looking for a drummer. Yeah, well, going back further, like when uh, I met Turner uh, with with the it was a, a Middle East show, Lifetime played during the day, and at night Jawbreaker was playing, and in between everyone who was at the like we all went out to eat at uh, Buddha's, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, me and Aaron Turner was sitting across from me and Randy, and we were being fucking really obnoxious, like. <laughs> Oh, like, acting like drunk idiots is before, though, like, we weren't drunk. We were like, you know, like... I think maybe you were. <laughs> no, I, you definitely were. And Aaron was kind of, like, laughing and, like, riffing with us. And uh, I remember he had, he had this, like, weird, like, I never met him from New Mexico before. I'm like, this kid talks funny. <laughs> 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 um, but, and then I saw him in Connecticut, like, a week after I moved to Boston, because Cable was playing with Neurosis, and we went up to um, Rhode Island and uh, Connecticut for those shows. And Aaron was at the Connecticut show, and he's like, hey, I heard you moved to Boston, we should start a band. So you'd get... known Turner prior to that, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he it just kind of came in, he kind of came out of nowhere, you know? And it's like, hey, this dude's cool, and he started doing the label and stuff. And, uh, you know, eventually we ended up doing a couple of, Cable ended up doing a couple of records yeah. on there. But yeah, yeah, I knew Aaron before uh, ISIS formed. Um, so... Uh, the first time me and Aaron jammed, it was Jake Bannon playing drums, uh, me playing guitar, Aaron Turner playing guitar, and Chris Marishak singing. That was the wow, first time. Wow, Chris I, singing. Yeah, just can just that singing. guy can can uh, that guy play drums? Jake, Uh he wasn't bad. No, he wasn't bad at all. I mean, he wasn't like he wasn't great. Was but, he able to, like, do what you guys wanted to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, we were just fucking around. I didn't right. even know. I was playing guitar. Like, that's, that's you know what I mean? Like, I had bought a guitar. I'm like, I'm a guitar player now. And then I quickly realized I'm fucking terrible at guitar. Um, then, I think about a year down the line, a, a little while later, I was doing this, another thing with Chris Marishak singing, me on bass, the drummer for Coleman? Morgan. Morgan, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. And this dude, Josh, on, on guitar. And... We were jamming a bunch, and I was like, it needs a second guitar. What do you guys think about getting Turner involved? And Josh didn't seem to want Aaron involved, but like, because I don't know why. But I was really pushing the, the idea of getting Aaron in the band. And we practiced with Aaron once, and we went out to eat afterwards. And he's like, Let, let's just do our own thing. Turner said that. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause, and that's when we had really started forming the ideas of what would be ISIS, you know, what kind of band we wanted to be, how we wanted to present ourselves you know like really make this like a 
you know, something more than just guys jamming. Like, we really got to do something special. Because I remember I, I ran into you, walk. I was walking up um, Calumet Street, and I saw you, like, on the street, and you were like, and you're like, <laughs> you're like, me and Aaron are starting, like, a metal band. I remember you, t- you specifically said you guys are starting a metal band. Well, I, that's interesting, because I, I don't think that's something I would say. That was, I remember very vividly. It was nighttime. Cause... If, uh, and I was going. I went to the Dunkin' Donuts down the street, and I was walking back to. Man, I must have been high. Thirty-eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I, I never liked metal. I think because I remember when we were recording like the demo, you referred to us as a metal band, and I was like, Aaron, are we a metal band? He's like, Yeah, I think I think we kind of are. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's an interesting thing too. That you recorded the ISIS demo. Yeah. 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 You know, so not only did you have a hand in kind of introducing these guys to the well, who would be their drummer, but you recorded the demo. Man. Yeah, Harris was on on that recording, but he technically wasn't a, a member of the band at that point. Well, because we made two demos. Um, I remember, so Aaron and I, like, Aaron, all right, okay, we're going to do this. He took off for New Mexico for the summer and did the, the Hollow Man record with his friends. And... Uh, He's like, Aaron's going to sing and play guitar. I'm going to play bass. Chris Marishak is going to be our keyboard player. We were all living together at the time. And Chris was like, Chris did this like project called The Missing Wad. He did it in like his room. And it was just him fucking around with like noise and shit. I'm like, yeah, you're our guy. <laughs> and uh, so we're like, we got a band. We just need a drummer. And like, we were really into the Brad Elrod era of today's the day, like willpower. Like, we need a guy like that. Well, yeah. And then, but then, weirdly enough, I remember we were at the Middle East upstairs, yoga's playing. Yoga. 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 <laughs> yoga. Not yoga. Know, Jesus Christ, man. Dude. I, Yo, get it together, all right? <laughs> the Slender Man was playing. Yeah. Uh, 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 yogurt's playing. No, uh, Loga's playing. And Aaron is, like, up front, kind of, like, almost like the drummer's, like, the front man. And I remember yep. being like, fuck, this guy's good. Yeah. I'm like, maybe this guy could be our guy. Like, he's totally not what we were thinking at all but like he's a really good drummer and he likes he, you know he was into the am rep stuff which is cool he wasn't like a hardcore kid you know he wasn't like you know wearing like krishna beads and shit <laughs> and he just came you kind of like even though aaron and i came from the hardcore scene we were looking to do something way outside of that we were that's where our main interests were and aaron had not aaron had, uh, harris had nothing to do with that world and then, yeah, you, you introduced us, and like, and he's like, hey, I heard you guys are you know, starting a band. You know, I'd like to play drums with you guys. And we recorded two songs with you and Dean. And then Aaron, I'm not sure, but Aaron Harris left for a while. I don't remember why. But then he came back, and we did the full proper demo uh, with you. Well, you know, I think Aaron being like a person of uh, very uh, high quality, mm-hmm. right? And I felt like Logo was like his band and those are his friends. And, you know, the the uh, impression that I got was that, you know, he was kind of felt some sort of loyalty to those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But I I actually, you know, had a conversation with him. And I was saying, because, you know, I, I respect that, man. I thought that's cool. But I yeah. was like, I said, look, you know, Aaron, like you came down here to do music. It's like I would reconsider your a stance on playing with the guy with ISIS because those guys are going to do something more substantial than I think what you probably would be able to do with, with Loga mm. specifically because like Sean and has his, his uh, energy was going more into his art practice. Right. Right. You know what I mean? And uh, I said, you know, let's think about it and maybe reconsider it and consider what those guys are doing and look at what your goals are in life as a drummer and a musician and make make it you know maybe maybe alter your decision to play with them. So that was kind of how I think he came back around with you guys. I, I'm a, well, thank you for that because um, we almost broke up like before we started because uh, I mean we could not. It was hard to find a, a quality drummer back then. That's always the, the case though, man. Yeah, it's it like it still is the case <laughs> trying to find a good drummer. You know. Yeah. I mean. If you're if you're in a band that's fairly well known, then you can start to like look around and all right, was it fly some dude in from like wherever to do that. But like when you're just from day one, if you're trying to find like the right guy, because that's like the make or break element of the band. T- 
totally. I, we and like I was like we already had our right guy. Now we got to find another one. Yep. And dude, we same with this one guy. I saw his band play at like a house party, and I was like, this guy's fucking good. I was I must have been hammered because we when we played together. It was awful. It was so bad. And uh, I was like, we need to get Aaron back. I mean, at, at, at some point, I think Turner was thinking about playing bass for Caven, and I'm like, if if that happens, this thing is never taking off. And it was right then that Aaron's, Aaron Harris was like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'd like to jam with you guys again. He came around. He came around. Yeah. And uh, obviously, I'm really glad he did. But when, that, that, when he came back, though, he was like... Dedicated, yeah, yeah, yeah. He came back, like, for real. Like, he was in it. Yeah, he was in it. He had yeah. opinions, uh, right. you know. Uh, yeah. And he was totally as dedicated as the, as the rest of us were at, at that time, for sure. That's a little bit of history that probably, you know, not too many people, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, I thought it'd be fun to, you know, go back and, yeah, you know, get a little bit of the, the deep history on this stuff. So, you guys record the demos, and then you start playing shows. Do you remember your first show? <laughs> I do. Um, it was in uh, Montreal with, the, with you guys. We all rode up in the uh, Hydrahead van together. Uh oh. We were a four-piece then. Uh, yes, it was Chris, Aaron, Aaron, and, and myself. And then we played another show the next day in Vermont. And I think that's shortly after that. No, it was, we played a show in Long Island that Rich Hall booked. And that's when we were like, uh, I want to play second guitar for you guys. And uh, we, we, um, you know, we discussed it. And uh, like second guitar really could expand what, what, what we want to do with this band. Like, initially, I thought it was cool to have, like, the Pink Floyd lineup of, like, just one guitar, keyboard, and, but sonically, like, when you jammed with us, like, right away, I knew, like, two guitars was absolutely the way to go. It's too bad you really didn't know how to play guitar. (laughs) (laughs) I was just going to say, yeah, two guitars add a lot if it's two guys that know how to play guitar. (laughs) Uh, That was pretty novice. Like, I remember, you know, I remember us talking about this, and then me getting the demo from you guys, and, like, sitting in my apartment. I was going through a rough stretch at that point. Mm-hmm. I was just living in the shithole, fucking drinking way too much. Like, anyway, I remember getting this and like playing along to it, playing along to it, and I was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I got the shit." And then I went up and jammed with you, and I'm like, "Wait a minute, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing." <laughs> like, Aaron's like, he's like playing chords and shit that makes sense. I'm like, I don't know, I, you know. So me and Aaron spent a lot of time back at a uh, 91 Hillside. We'll mm-hmm. keep mentioning that address. Uh, and Aaron kind of showed me, oh, no, this is kind of how you play guitar, yeah. like the real way. You That's know, funny. The early cable shit when I played guitar, I was just making shit up, man. I began to do a couple chords or whatever, but like, you know, I was making up my own chords, yeah. you know, which we, <laughs> we'd refer to as cable chords yeah, down the road. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was a little like, you know, I mean, obviously my time in the band was short. We did a tour together. We played some shows together. It was a lot of fun, but I wasn't in a place, you know, a good place at the time. And, uh, you know, I ended up leaving the band, and you guys got uh, Mike Gallagher. Yeah. Uh, who, who could play guitar? Who also worked at the warehouse, too. Exactly. <laughs> What's funny is um, I was thinking Chris Papecki, the other guitar player for Cast Iron Hike. Really? Yeah, that's what goes. I, I like that guy. I didn't know yeah. Mike. He worked at the warehouse, but I didn't really know him. And I knew Chris, and I knew he liked a lot of the same stuff we did. But uh, I don't know who suggested Mike, but... Um, uh, it was a it was a a good match right away. I mean, maybe not right away. I think Mike was sort of like you know dipping his toe in like oh let's let's see what this is about. Um, we also lost Chris Marishak after that tour. He, you know, wanted to uh, focus on other things in his life, and so Mike fell into place first. We're like all right, who are we going to get to do electronics and keyboards? And we were all kind of friends. Or Aaron and I, Aaron Turner and I knew Jay Randall. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we knew he was a character. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's, he's a good guy, though, a really good guy. And he had samplers and equipment. We're like, literally no one else that we know has this shit. Because let's, let's also frame this up back then in the 90s. Like, yeah. Our, first of all, we're all, we're all young. We're all, like, kids, basically. Yeah, I was 20, yeah. 22 at that. 21 when the band started. Our first, right. Yeah. Yeah, so like all these like weird little ideas about stuff and like little insecurities and like hang ups. This is like front and center with everybody, right? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, in the 90s, electronics, you actually had to have, you couldn't just like pull up your laptop 
and have like Ableton Live on there right. and fucking go for it and create a whole universe of sounds. You had to have like boxes, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like like components. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Randall, so the guy, the electronics guy, had to actually know about electronics. It didn't mm. mean that he had a, a laptop, you know. Like now it's like I have a la- I have a phone, I have an iPad, and I have an electronics guy. So Randall it was an agoraphobic nosebleed, yes, yeah. and you know, and he had some other stuff that he was doing, and he was like a guy who made sounds, right? So that's that's the important thing right there. Yeah, yeah um, I don't want to speak ill of Jay because I, I do like him, but I think it was pretty clear right away that he didn't have the musical ability we were looking for. Chris was not really Chris. Chris he played drums and he sang, but he wasn't he wasn't a keyboard player. But he would create samples. He would like you know, like he like he knew what he, he knew what he was doing. Like he had specific ideas about what he wanted. Jay was like pressing buttons and fucking around. Like when we recorded the Red Sea with him, like everything had to be synced. Kurt synced everything with the drums. Like he used the drums as like triggers, so the samples and what he was playing would would, would make sense. Right. It's nothing against Jay. It's just he was coming from a totally different place and approach to electronics. So he's, he was a harsh noise guy. And we were like, you know, kind of laid out what we were thinking about what we wanted. And he was like, you know, you know <laughs> I'm going to just do my thing. And uh, I don't think it was a personality match between him and Mike. That uh, I think Jay might have rubbed Mike the wrong way. It's Jay, like I said, he's a fucking character back then, man. But... Uh, he, he just one day just like didn't show up to practice and we kind of talked. We're like, uh, I don't think it's going to work out with Jay. And coincidentally, maybe like a week later, Jay's like, uh, I'm not into this. We're like, all right, that problem solved. Now who the fuck? <laughs> like, how did, like, there's no way we're going to find another guy. Yeah, but, but, but. You guys found the fucking okay. mother. You guys found the guy, which yeah. I think was awesome. Well, it's funny because Cliff, who also worked at the Newberry Comics <laughs> Warehouse, uh, Wanted to play guitar, like when we were thinking about, you know, I was thinking about Papeki and, and I, it was Aaron Harris who wanted Mike, that's right, and, um, and Cliff, I think, approached Aaron and was like, I, I, I play guitar for you guys, and Aaron's like, I think we already got someone. So now when we needed a keyboard player, Aaron Harris is like, hey, you know, like, I remember that guy Cliff, he plays keyboards too. And Cliff uh, also had that band, The Gersh. Yeah, that's uh, right. Which was right. like his band, and Cliff, you know, Cliff's also, he's from Cleveland originally. Yeah. And he's friends with a lot of, you know, like the guys in uh, in Keel Hall. And he's like, you know, someone who's been around. Yeah. he. I wouldn't call him a hardcore kid or anything. Like, he was definitely not from that world. But, like, he's somewhat, you know. he. Yeah. Um, and he had a totally different approach, whereas Chris and, and Jay were, like, more experimental. Like, Cliff had a, a music background. He could actually play keyboard. Exactly, yeah. So, that like, and it, like... It, it wasn't what, what what we initially wanted. We wanted like a sample and, and stuff like that, but it became like, like oh, this is gonna add such a new dynamic to this band, and that would be the uh, you know the lineup that 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 stayed together till the end. Yeah. 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 Having Cliff in the band, I think, was was like really. It, it was huge. It was a yeah. big step up. Because at that time, at that time, like, that wasn't really something like I you know Neurosis really was the only yeah. band that comes to mind that was doing that kind of thing. And there was other, you know, you guys might have been one of the first bands to really incorporate that element within, you know, not like the world of underground metal or whatever you want to call it or like hardcore yeah. post whatever, like post rock or whatever it is, <laughs> <laughs> which is like a, I guess like a, a genre that the journalists created for you guys. Post metal. Post metal. Yeah. That's, so what's post rock? I don't know. I, I, I started hearing that term like when bands like Mogwai and Godspeed, You Black Emperor, started coming out. Okay. And then, uh, after, you know, like when, when Oceanic was coming out, a lot of people were like, ISIS sounds like Mogwai now. Hmm. And that was going around a lot. It might have been because something one of us said in an interview or something. I don't know how that came about. And then all the, like, you know, just started seeing this term around Oceanic post metal. But, but let's talk about maybe the, that sort of transition, I guess. It's like, because in the beginning, um, there was a very, you know, having been involved in some of the earlier demos with you guys, there was like a uh, a seed that found itself more from like, I would say, you know, today's a day, buzz oven, I hate God, mm-hmm. like that kind of 
like a starting point, that sort of foundation for the band. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, but then like, yeah, around Oceanic things started. It's almost like you guys from putting all these influences together, that might've been the record where all the influences kind of actually uh, gelled into this aggregate of all of those things. Plus maybe whatever Cliff might've brought to the band. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off. Man. I'm sorry. Celestial was like, I, the goal like of the band around Celestial was just loud heavy um pummel you with fucking repetitive riffs and that's what we didn't you know um after that we you know we were getting a little bit older i think it was you know, 25 26 when we started writing oceanic and we were all getting into really different things uh in our lives and what we were listening to and we wrote a couple songs for oceanic uh, that didn't make the cut while we were just writing stuff and it wasn't really going anywhere and and until we wrote uh false light was the first was the third song we wrote but the first song we kept for the record and that's sort of when we had like the discussion like well, what what are we doing with this like like where do we want to go and like you know, we need to you know we wanted to focus more on dynamics things like that it, it was definitely a conscious decision like we need to like do something different or this isn't gonna last this isn't gonna work and and, and and right right around then it, it just clicked. We just Cliff was coming out of his shell a lot like more because I think during Celeste he still didn't really, you know, know us that well. And with Oceania he felt more comfortable uh, around us and he was starting to write and he started playing a little bit more. You know, breaking out the guitar. Yeah. And you know it kind of started with like Aaron and Aaron writing like you know writing together a lot and now like people were uh, adding more of, of their voice into it. Mike Gallagher started writing more. I was always really shy about bringing ideas to, to, to practice. I was really good at critiquing other people's ideas, <laughs> <laughs> but bringing my own. And I had a few riffs on Oceanic. You know, it just, it really, we really hit our stride there. And and and, and I, re I remember recording it and and like listening back, and I'm like, I am really happy about this, but it, I don't know if anyone's gonna like it. I think I think this might end us. <laughs> you know. Uh, but obviously it didn't, <laughs> it went in our favor. But that was also this, the types of, in the, the tours that you guys were doing too. Yeah. There was like a changeover around that time, I believe, right? Well, yeah, we were, we toured with Napalm Death and Soylent Green around the Celestial time. And, and, and it, the response to us was very, uh, I mean, there was a few good nights, but people really didn't like us. And some nights I felt like they were like hostile towards us, uh, but it, you know, it's it's. I, I appreciate the experience, but I was like, why? Like, I, I, why are we on tour with these bands? I mean, Soylent Green were our friends, and it was fun to to, to, to be with them. And Napalm Death were great guys, but I just wasn't really kind of enjoying. I wasn't really uh, enjoying myself that much. And um, you know, with Oceanic, we turned into like a headlining band. We could take out bands that we would thought uh, would make for a more interesting bill. We took out you know, die like a hip hop group. And we went out with Oxes, who were just, I don't even know how to describe them. It's just a weird band. And, uh, you know, we were opening for bands like Mogwai now. Um, and, you know, just expanding our uh, our reach that way. Also, signing to Ipecac, Oceana coming out in Ipecac, was huge for us. Because um, at that point, we were being courted by more like metal labels, popular metal labels. And we came very close to signing with one. And... Uh, I think one day we were looking at the catalog and there's a picture of a a, a dick biting a girl on the lip. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, do we want to do this? Do we want, is this what the, what we want to like be associated with? And, uh, you know, it was around the James Pollock and uh, uh, was friends with us too. And he had a, a you know, a better friends with Turner. And he's like, hey, you know, uh, I know Patton, you know, he's got that new label. I'll send him your, you know, your record, and I'm like, oh, fuck, that would be amazing to be on it, like Mike Patton's label, you know, like that. Especially at that point, he had such a rabid following that anything on that label would be gobbled up by his fans. And uh, luckily, he dug it. I, I remember he see, he said about Celestia, he was like, it's pretty cool, but I can see that you guys are gonna do something a lot cooler, or something like. He said something oh, wow. that was like, like a compliment, but also kind of like, hmm, <laughs> you know, you know. Um, and, and yeah, that, 
blew the doors open for us. I think we got taken seriously in like indie rock circles and, and uh, you know, art rock, you know, people just, the, the backing of Patton gave you like, uh, like a prestige or something that I don't think we could would have had on on a more traditional metal label. Uh, yeah, it's uh, just to back up a little bit with the Ipecac thing. So, did Mike Patton and Ipecac sign you guys off of hearing Celestial, or had you done demos for Oceanic that he listened to? No, it was just on Celestial. Cause I mean, doing demos back then wasn't really like a thing. Like. Uh, maybe sometimes we'd bring a recorder to, I don't, actually, I don't think we ever recorded our practices back then. And I can't remember, but we definitely didn't send any demos to them. Um, I just remember like we recorded Oceanic and we did like a 10 day tour with like the Melvins and I guess Buzz, you know, called and like, Hey, you know, called back and like, these guys are cool. <laughs> you know, they're good, you know, <laughs> good, good job. <laughs> yeah. I guess prior to that, it's like, the, like that's really the, the sort of you know, boundary le- level, I guess, between, like, you know, the Napalm Death tours, and prior to that, you were doing tours with, like, more of that kind of New England-style metal hardcore yeah. that was uh, really, really popular around that time. And, um, you know, I, I even back then thought you guys didn't really fit in, but but the fans seemed to really appreciate what you are doing when yeah. you would go out with bands like Cave In and, you know, those other types of bands. Yeah, yeah, def- oh, yeah, yeah, we toured the U.S. with Cave In. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it was a, a ton of fun. But uh, yeah, again, we wanted to broaden our horizons, but also kind of, uh, again, like we, ICE has kind of had like a code, like we're not going to do anything just to do it, just to, for money or just for popularity. It has to be something we believe in, especially later in the band's career where we're getting like offers to tour with like bands like you know, Disturbed and big bullshit like that. You mean you didn't take the Disturbed tour? I mean, I fought <laughs> hard for it, but I mean... That's fucking trippy, man, <laughs> to think about that. Yeah, or like, per, like okay, like uh, a band like Pearl Jam. They asked us to do like some dates in Canada with them. And I think it's a band we all respect and some of us even like. But we're like, this, this that doesn't make any sense. Like, to, to do, to tour, like, there's no way fans are going to dig it. And uh, we were touring a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. We were touring a lot at that point, And uh, I think we needed a break. But every every offer came with like you know um, a lot of thought behind it, and um, that's why we didn't really open for a lot of bands. If you noticed, you know, um, yeah, yeah. One of the things that, as an outsider, like kind of viewing this whole trajectory of the band, there was definitely it almost seemed like there was like um, like a beginning and an end point, and like the end point being like in, in my mind as an observer that seeing the band as something that probably wouldn't last forever. Yeah. That there would be a, a, a beginning, which I saw, you know, and then yeah, at some point an ending, which would result in some kind of work that you guys have done that would be kind of a culmination of all the things that you've been through. And then the pathway to that ending, I always really respected the way that you guys made the decisions because you didn't open for Disturbed or, you know, like... I, I probably would have taken that tour, honestly. You know what I mean? And like, <laughs> but like, you know, I thought the the decision making, um, not you know, obviously not being privy to the conversations you guys had, but it always it always seemed like everything you did made made sense, like in building upon the thing before it. Yeah. Uh, sp- speaking to that point a little bit, like you know, I know you turned down a lot of high profile tours because you guys didn't agree on you know the disturbed or whatever obviously um <laughs> but you did accept the tour with tool which you know would end up being a, a pretty big part uh, of the story you know uh you guys would go on to be friends with those guys and work on other projects uh with you know in some ways with those guys so how was that experience you know i think people would be interested to know did you enjoy that experience playing big places like that or what was crazy about that tour we did with tool we would play and then everyone left <laughs> uh no yeah it was it was insane like i i just never thought it would come to that like i never thought we'd be touring with this one of the biggest bands in the world i have to say at some point the association with tools started to annoy me um now i don't mean to sound ungrateful because i i love the guys in the band i, I like their band but it, it seemed at some point that's all anyone wanted to talk about was them. And that's all, all of a sudden, like every 
article about us, like the band ISIS, you know, heavily influenced by Tool. It, it, it kind of started this narrative that was like, like people thought I never thought to pick up a, a bass until I heard Undertow. Right. You know, kind of coming from like the punk rock scene or whatever, a little bit of that was like, hey man, I, I've been doing this since I was a kid and at a DIY level. And like, this is a big, huge major label band, you know, like, um, so I, but to back it up, I, I, I greatly appreciate that, that those guys really, really liked the band a lot and they were fans and that's why they wanted us to be there on tour with them. It wasn't just like we need a slot to fill, you know. What I mean? So we need someone to open uh, up the show. They really, really liked us, and we were treated really, really well on on that tour. And we were we were paid well. We could tour in a, in a bus, which was the first and last time we toured in a bus. <laughs> um, and you know, Justin wanted to come and play on the on music. Oh, I want to come jam on Pen Up to come with you, mate. Um, uh, we're like, yeah, of course. This guy's cool. He, he's a great bass player. He came, he played some shows with us too. He came out, he flew out to South by Southwest to play on uh, the song he plays on on Panopticon. Uh, oh, fuck, what's it called? Free Bird? Yes. Uh, it's a second to last. Fuck, I can't remember it. Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, and uh, you know, Adam, when we were working on uh, the last record, Wavering Radiant, Adam, Adam Jones pops up on, on, on that record a couple times. And he brought a lot to it. It wasn't just like, here's a guitar riff. Altered Course, yeah, I knew that. That was the name of the song. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, uh, you guys came to some of the stadium shows, didn't you? Who? Uh, when when we played with Tool? No, I wasn't, I wasn't invited to any of those. <laughs> oh, that's right. We had security <laughs> kick you out. <laughs> Someone was like, brought it up, like, no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I, I went to the show in Massachusetts, in, uh, which was pretty insane. You know, like I called you when i got there on my flip phone or whatever i had at the time my walkie talkie yeah. uh and like you know you sent our, our mutual friend uh, chris nelson out to like fetch me and uh, my wife and took us into the bobbles of like this shed like giant amphitheater which i never thought i'd be on that side of the fence you know yeah. and watched you guys from the stage which was it was pretty crazy but what i remember is the next day after that show i was in providence rhode island you guys had a day off from the Tool tour, mm -hmm. and you're playing at a venue called the Living Room, which we, we That's know. That's fucking dumb. Yeah, it was like a real, the original Living Room back in the day was amazing, but yeah. this they had moved to this other location, which was kind of shot. It used to look like it was like a restaurant or something, like a Beefsteak Charlie's or, or something yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> fun, fun <laughs> fun <room>. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was? That's what it looked like. Yeah. But the funny thing about that is like, you know, because I'd been at a million shows there, and I pulled up and like. There's like this tiny parking lot. You had a fucking huge tour bus oh, God. Yeah. parked out front. But your your band at the time, Versoma, also oh, yeah. played that oh, show. That's right. Yeah, I remember that. You played yeah. the last show too, the one yeah. in New York. Just like yeah, when you guys had it was the off nights that you guys yeah. played. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I for, almost forgot about that run. Yeah, yeah. We got a lot of shit for that bus. For some reason, oh fucking rock stars on a bus. <laughs> you know, you know, whatever. Ah, uh, yeah. People like the imagine when, back then. That's what people were stressed out about. Yeah. Can you imagine now, like, what shit people would talk with? They have, like, even less to be concerned about. Right, yeah, there? exactly. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, that that tour coincided with the In Absence of Truth album. Yes. Right, which a lot of review. I had never heard you guys compared to Tool before. So just kind of go back to what you were saying about the association with them. Like, I started to see a lot of reviews for that record. It was like, oh, this sounds like Tool. This sounds like Tool. Yeah, um, that was part of why I was annoyed, and also because I, it, I, I have a lot of negative feelings about that record. And uh, when it got such kind of like a mediocre response, I was like, it hurt because I kind of agreed. I was like, we actually just made a really mediocre, disjointed record. And um, it, it, we were doing the biggest things of our career at this point, you know, playing to the most people, touring with Tool. Uh, and we had made a record I didn't really like. <laughs> and it was a, that was kind of difficult to, um, to deal with. Like, I, well, I remember we were recording the song um, A Thousand Shards, and I remember calling my wife at the time, because she was, her and I were living in New York, and the band was based out of L.A., uh, which was 
seemed like a good idea at the time, but like maybe it has a lot to do with this, why that record sounds the way it does. Because, you know, Mike and I were in New York. Mike would call me and uh, he'd go, when are you uh, thinking about coming out to L.A. for practice? I, I'd give him a date. And then he would book a flight for a week earlier. <laughs> Uh, um, so I, you know, and then I'd show up and like the, there'd be progress going on this stuff, these parts of songs. And I'm like, I don't like this, but I wasn't here. And if I say anything, that's exactly what someone's going to say. Right. Well, where the fuck were you? <laughs> and they'd be right. You know, like it was, it was, you know, a, a weird experiment to live on a different coast that, you know, but it was my job at that point. I didn't really, you know, I, I could do it. Um, I don't know where the fuck I was going with any of that. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess, do you feel like you being on the East Coast uh, is why the record, you don't enjoy that record? No, not, not entirely. Um, I don't know. I think that was kind of the beginning of us fracturing as what we wanted to do as a band, you know. I s slowly started to realize we we were just kind of becoming this, like, rock band. I wanted to be, like, you know, I was always, every I, I, everything was, like, swans. Godspeed you, Black Emperor. Look at what they're doing. They're making these monumental fucking statements. Like, they don't even songs. Like, they're, like, fucking statements. I'm like, why aren't we doing that? You know? Um... Like there was uh, like a con like writing for uh, in the absence of truth, uh, you know. We we want it seemed like we wanted to move away what we were good at. If we were like doing this like big building part, there was like like hey let's cut this in half and move on to something else. And it just started to feel disjointed to me like part 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 and like every every song is the same length on that record and has the same structure. It, it, it it's just that's when the the cracks really started to appear to me that we weren't really quite gelling like we used to. Um, and, you know, I even thought about maybe, like, doing the touring cycle and then just, like, calling it a day, but I was like, I, I don't want to go out on a record. Like, I, I want to know we can do something better. Um, and there was still a lot of momentum behind the band going, you know, but I do feel like we kind of took a hit with that record. Like, everything before that was just, like, heaps of praise and, like, oh, you know, we're the best fucking thing in the world. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um... To all of a sudden, like, oh, ISIS are just fucking, you know, tool clones or like, you know. I never saw that, though, man. It's like, Thank you. <laughs> I, I, mean, no, I mean, you know, I, it's just such a lazy writing thing to do, to just say, oh, yeah, this, this band just toured with this other monumental band. So now I'm going to say that they sound like this band. And I never really understood why people com made, those, made those comparisons, really. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of like like back in the day when we were called Neurosis clones. But, but Neurosis was the only point of reference anyone had because people in that scene weren't listening to Godflesh or the Melvins or anything remotely like that, but they knew Neurosis. And they knew Neurosis had keyboards, and they knew that we were really into them. You know, Aaron had dreads <laughs> and everything when we started. So um, that was like anyone's point. So now, like, Tool was everyone's point of reference. Because you kind of stepped up into like that con commercial sort of world where Tool was like the artsy band in the commercial scene. Right, yeah, and exactly. you guys were all were an artsy band coming up from the underground scene into the more commercial scene. So Right. And so they just made that A equals B equals C thing. Yeah, exa okay. exactly, yeah. Weird. <clears throat> Weird and lazy, you know. Agreed. Uh, which leads us up to Wavering Radiant. Um, so... Do the, do you know the the other guys in the band feel the same way about in the absence of truth, or do you think you're standalone? That is everyone unhappy with that? Do you think? To to different degrees, yeah, I I think so. I think we all we didn't really start talking about our displeasure about that record. I think until Wave and Rating came out, and then now that we've been broken up for ten years, you know, everyone's you know Turner's definitely voiced his dis displeasure with with that record. And, you know, everyone does some, even Aaron Harris, who was on a podcast where he was like, yeah, not her best, you know. <laughs> so you guys had worked with uh, Matt Bales mm -hmm. for the previous records. Um, and then for Wavering Radiant, you worked with Joe Barishi. Uh, Barishi. <laughs> I'm not, you're not the only one who can't talk today. <laughs> um, so 
the decision to move away from that, what did that stem from you guys maybe not being so happy with uh, in the absence of truth? Uh, well, it's funny. We met with Joe uh, about recording in the absence of truth. And uh, we met with Joe. We really liked him. And uh, we're like, all right, let's just do this with Joe. And we got cold feet, basically. Like, we we're like, let's just run back to the safety net of Matt. Um, and, you know, nothing worked on In the Absence of Truth in my eyes. And I'm not blaming Matt, but that record sounds really weird. We were in the studio for a long time, too, because we thought, I have more time in the studio, better record. But more time in the studio doesn't mean you, like, the songs you've written aren't going to be any better. <laughs> um, I, I, I remember Matt being like, he would like, we just finished a song and he'd go, hmm, this is a weird record. And I'm like, Matt doesn't like this. <laughs> like, I was convinced that Matt wasn't into it. Like, he, like, he had felt like I felt like, oh, this is, this is a, we're not making the record we should be making. But, you know, Matt, Matt did what he could. And, uh, but we knew, like, we have to, to do something different for this one, different producer, something. And we had met with Joe before. We liked him. And he likes the band. And, you know, he said the right thing. is like, you guys never sounded on record like you do live. And he's like, that's what I want. That's the record I want to make for you guys. Bring that power that you have live. And I think he definitely did that. And Joe had worked with, you know, bands, you know, Tool. <laughs> <laughs> so now, now the press had another thing to use to compare right. you guys to them. Right, you guys weren't doing yourselves any favors by not getting compared but, to Tool. He also did, like, Tomahawk, uh, Queens yeah. of the Stone Age, Melvin. Caius. You know, Caius, yeah. yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, I just had to throw the Tool thing back, back <laughs> in, in your face. face yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, in reading up a little bit about this, uh, you know, it's been uh, 12 years since the right the other day was the 12th uh year anniversary 12 year anniversary of this mm. coming out so uh, i don't know how good your memory is about the recording process but i did read that the drums and the keyboards were recorded at the famous sound city studio is that true and if so were you there for any of that and where was the rest of the record recorded well randy um <laughs> that's half true yeah the drums were done there <clears throat> and we all were there for the tracking of the drums uh, the keyboards were, were were done where where the bass guitar and the vocals were done at uh, uh, Jayhawk Joe's House of Compression, which is like Joe's like studio in Pasadena. Um, uh, if it, I think we went to the the place to do the drums. We just wanted like huge drum sounds. Joe wanted to do the drums there, and like uh, so we we're like, yeah, sure. Uh, that was a fun time tracking the drum. I, um, I remember there was a, a rumor that the, the place was haunted. One room in particular was haunted. And uh, all of my off time I spent in that room reading ghost stories. <laughs> Do you have any supernatural experiences? No, I didn't. Uh, one time I heard this like, strange sound come on out of nowhere, and I was like, oh, man, this is it. But it was Cliff's keyboard amp. It was in the room with me. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, maybe some, maybe some keyboards were recorded there, but to my memory, I don't, I, I don't think it was. If you ever want to re revisit Sound City, it's not there anymore because Dave Grohl bought it and put it in his garage. <laughs> because, you know, that's where he records all his punk rock shit. Yeah, garage. yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck the guy. What punk rock stuff does he have? Has he been doing? Is he... <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a big Dave Grohl fan either. I myself. think that board he has in his, uh, uh, in his garage... His garage is probably the size of the fucking neighborhood too. Um, I think that's a board like uh, yeah, that was on that that Joe used to track uh, Aaron's drums. Yeah, there's a whole documentary about it. Yeah, whatever the fuck it's called. There is. Um, so, was your process now that you're working with Joe and not Matt? Was, you know, was the process any different? Like, what was different about the recording? Everything. Um, <laughs> Matt was very much of like a, a, a take guy, like where you'd spend like hours on a part and to the point where I was like, I hate what I'm playing. And with Joe, like I would just go through something like, all right, cool, next part. I'm like, what, really? Like, yeah, that's perfect, go. Wow, um, interesting. He had suggestions. He came to practice uh, with like, you know, with like a recorder and be like, try it this tempo, try it that tempo. Uh, you know, you know, he had a few bass suggestions, things to change. Like, you know, you go high here, like you really need some low. 
or like do a slide here. It's going to sound awesome. He had a lot of ideas, and um, you know most of them most of them were good. Uh, I wasn't there for every one. You know, I know he worked a lot with Cliff for you know tried tried different sound here. That um, no one was there when he did the vocals, but I, I think he did a great job with 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 Aaron. Brought out some 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 great stuff in him. Uh, it was fun working with Joe. You know, he's the Italian guy from Jersey. <laughs> you know, I don't so, know him much about him. Um, I just, you know, I just know that he did these records. Really. Yeah, now he was he was a he was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, he he had opinions and ideas, and you know, and not that Matt didn't, but Matt didn't really get that. You know, he was just all about getting like the best take. You know, making like Matt can tell if your guitar is just a little bit out of tune. His ear is fucking insane. But Joe just had a different different approach. Is a little bit more laid back. You know, Matt's kind of an intense guy. Joe is, you know, uh, you know, kind of like I said, uh, more laid back. It was just fun. The recording of that album was fun. Where I was miserable making um, the last one. Although the writing of the record wasn't that much fun. But the recording of it was. The writing of Wayward Radio. Wasn't yeah, fun? yeah. Oh. Um, well, like I said, like the band was, uh, the cracks were becoming really noticeable. And when I had moved back to L.A. from New York, because I, I never wanted to go through the hell of fucking flying to uh, back and forth between New York and L.A. Like, you know, once, a, once or twice, you know, every other uh, every month or every other month. Um, that when we were getting together to, like, write these songs, Aaron Turner was going through a pretty big change in his life and uh, in, in his personal life. And it was very clear Aaron was a very different guy now than when, when the band started and uh, that we all were and but i could really tell like writing the first bunch of songs that i don't know like i didn't feel fully present i didn't feel that maybe turner was fully present i, I could start to feel his interest waning and i knew we were like i was like we are writing our last record there's no way that it's, it can continue after this that common ground was really starting to shrink and a lot of times, you know, we'd be like in the in the space, not talking to each other, looking at our shoes, with that amp, you know, humming in the background. And there was days where it was like pretty. It didn't look like it was gonna come together. I'm like, again, we just got a bunch of parts. Nothing's really gelling. And then slowly but surely, chipping away at things, they started started to work. But I just remember not having a lot of fun writing that and coming back from practice really frustrated a lot. I can't know how everyone else felt, but that's how I felt. <coughs> Prior to the release on April 21st of 2009, um, this was funny when I was doing a little reading about this record. <laughs> so uh, I guess like almost a month before, it says you guys added the song 20 minutes, 40 years to your MySpace page. <laughs> MySpace. <laughs> wow. And I was like, wow. See, I, when I think of MySpace, it's, it's like 25 years ago, wow. but it was really only like 12 years ago. And then it also said you made the whole album available for streaming a week before its release. Really? And when I think back to that time, I can't think of many bands doing that. Like, I don't know if my time is just off. Of, were bands streaming yeah, that, their that, albums? that didn't exist back then, man. Like, no one right. did that. Now it's like, that's how you re release albums. Exactly. You but know? 12 years ago, you know, when I referenced MySpace and then streaming the whole album, I was like, bands never did that back then. So I thought that was pretty funny. So For the record, I have no recollection of doing that. <laughs> well, you probably weren't running the MySpace page <laughs> if, if I was... Uh, I can see releasing the single, but not the whole album. I, I don't remember doing that. We very well could have, but I, I, I don't remember. You guys also made a video for that song. Um, and you made videos for previous songs or previous records, but uh, were you a, a fan of the videos or the video, specifically the video for uh, 20 Minutes, 40 Years? Um, Mike, you've made some videos. How, how, do you, how do you feel about music videos? The, the ones where I'm not involved, in person or usually better they're like because yeah. it's like tedious work really yeah i mean we were, we were never in any, any of our videos and we have a few videos and i do uh, I, I i don't hate any of them but i always just viewed it like they always came out like a year later than yeah. they should and like the, you know because you're trying to do something with like hardly and spend it as little as money as possible so they never come out on time and um 
I, I just always kind of viewed it as like um, a waste of money because there's no more MTV. Like, what, this is going to get played on our MySpace page or, you know, a link to, like, you know, um, a link to it will be posted on a metal site. But, like, the people who are going to see it are the people who would already want to see it. I, I didn't really see videos just reaching new people like they did back uh, when we were coming up. I mean, I, I heard about so many bands because, like, 120 minutes and... And sometimes Headbangers Ball. Well, that, that was the, uh, you know, they said it got some airplay. Because that was like, remember when MTV tried to relaunch Headbangers Ball? Right. With Jamie Beagley. from Hapery as yeah. the host? It said it did get some airplay on Headbangers Ball and MTV too. Wow. But, I mean, outside of that, that seems like, you know, the kind of the tail end of what making videos, there's nowhere to play them. There's no real platform. It's kind of pre-YouTube taken off. Yeah. And like, I think post-MTV not mm -hmm. being a, a thing. I think YouTube, though, like, honestly, it's like, I know, um, you know, we've done a, Tombs has done a series of videos, and, uh, yeah, he's I, done a bunch. I don't check, I, like, uh, Dr our, Justin, our drummer, is the guy who really does most of the, he, like, monitors our Spotify, he's, like, kind of, like, the tech guy and all that stuff, so <laughs> he said that the songs that get the, the highest number of plays are, actually coincides with the songs we have videos released for. Interesting. Yeah. So, I don't know. so maybe I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I'm just saying well, that's that's now that that's like twelve. You know, it's like now in 2021. Yeah. Versus like you know back when that record came out. So you know over over ten years. So. Yeah, a, a good video in like the late in the 80s or like 90s could really like, okay, like to bring up Tool again, I wouldn't. I mean that that video for uh for what was it, sober. Sober. It's like yeah. this is fucking cool. Wow, I've never really seen anything like this. Yeah, and made the band more interesting to me. Well, that that actually made careers. Like having yeah. having a hit video made a career for a band in the eighties. Totally. Really. Yeah. You know. Uh, but yeah, we we got some now, now that you know, like there's some distance, and you know, we got some cool videos that are out there. None of them are embarrassing, you know, and all, all of them look you know professional. So, so they exist. Great. Uh, speaking of tool. <laughs> Jesus. Speaking uh, of tool, do you like neurosis? <laughs> uh, Adam Jones, a guitar player, played on a couple tracks on Wavering Radio. Yes. He played guitar on one that says he played keyboards on another. Is that the case? Or did he just play guitar? He he was never in the studio with us. He just came up to I don't know who he talked to. He's like, Hey, I want to play in your record. Did you get it from the sidewalk? Yeah. <laughs> well he's obviously good friends with Joe Barisi and the um Friend of the band, he's it's probably Aaron Harris because I those guys were closer, and uh, we all agreed like Hall of the Dead had some space for him, and we Joe sent him the song, and a few days later he sent back what he had did, and I'm like oh you know we got this other like kind of like just free floating kind of like ambient noise piece, and he threw yeah he played keyboards on that too, so that that is. He might play guitar on it too. I, I I don't know. I wasn't. Yeah, it said he played keys on the track title track, Wavering Radio. Yes, correct. Yeah. Man, you really, you really fucking did your. You know, you did a good job on this, man. <laughs> Someone's gonna take care of this. Yeah, look at this guy. He's like, he's got all his notes together. Look at this. Hey, do you want to say something? Hey, I'm I, I'm just here, man. This is good. Uh, and there was also two tracks recorded in that session that did not make the album. Which, uh, me and you have talked about this a lot. Yeah, well, yeah. I really like those songs. and uh, But, you know, uh, Patio Bulfo ended up on an Adult Swim series. I think you guys were one of the first bands to kind of do that. Did it? Yeah, it did. <laughs> it did. Yeah, you got to get it together, bro. <laughs> now, that's kind of like a sort of a prestigious thing. Like, you know, like Mast it? Mastodon and oh, Sleep okay. and all these big bands have uh, contributed to that. Um and Way Through Wo Woven Branches also ended up, I believe, on the Japanese version of Wavering Radiant and on the Melvin's Isis Split. Yeah, but both those songs are on the Melvin's Isis Split. Those Do you know those songs at all, Jeff? I try to forget they exist. <laughs> those are the first two songs we wrote for the record. Um, yeah, I don't like those songs. I, <laughs> at all. I, I think that was like a big argument about like, because we knew we had more songs than we needed for the record. Like, this is way too fucking long to have all these songs on it. And I think we all, what was it? The, um, the what foe, though? Paleo foe. That was de the hotly debated one, whether that should be on the record or not. I, you, you know where I stand. 
Um, the other way through woven brand, I think that was a pretty easy decision for us to cut that one. Um, but uh, yeah, the other one that that was an argument, I believe. Um, and uh, I, it looks like I won that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you know. Uh, I can't remember. There were some people who were on my side and some people who weren't. Uh, but I mean, they came out. Uh, yeah, the the Melvin split. I I I, I knew they would eventually. I just I just don't like those <laughs> songs at all, man. Uh, but again, yeah, they're out there, and if you like them, great. All the power to you. <laughs> those songs are also on the. Uh... A collection that you guys did it's like the three disc thing with the uh, EPs and all that stuff on it the songs from the saw blade EP and oh, uh, oh. for uh, temporal yeah right yeah yeah that's that stuff's on there as well so well I like that stuff so well thank you yeah, yeah this fucking guy this guy, <laughs> this guy did his homework here man should I keep going dude if we're, uh, <laughs> I guess well, you got this whole like array of notes there that's awesome so the record's done recording time for the tour cycle and i believe the first tour u.s tour was with tunes and yeah. pelican yeah right yeah so yeah it's like we felt really bad for mike <laughs> no one cares about his band we figured throw him a bone do him a favor you know i hear you i appreciate that man <laughs> wasn't my idea yeah i think so <laughs> no um yeah, like again, like we wanted, uh, we wanted to tour like with our friends, you know, and we we've been touring with Mike forever. Like I think we've every one of your bands have done done shows with us, but I think this was your longest run. You did like the the West Coast and some of the East Coast, right? I don't think we did any of the East Coast dates. It was um no oh actually no, some yeah, of you what? played uh, yeah that's right we played in New York Canada, uh, New in York, Canada uh, we played Northampton Northampton all right so there you go there's my shot memory but um. Yeah, that was, there was, uh, all right, there was two tours. Yes. There was the first one, we did the East Coast dates. But the final tour, we, you did the East Coast with the Melvins. Yeah. All right, so that was the last, and now, coincidentally, the last show was, was in fucking uh, Montreal. Montreal, yeah. Um, yeah, that touring cycle with you guys in, in the U.S. and with Pelican was a, a blast, like, that was probably one of my favorite tours I think we ever did, actually, because like all three bands got along really well, and like it was yeah. fun, and we just had a good time. I thought. Yeah, like I don't remember any of the shows being bad. Nah, the um, shows were all really good. Yeah, well, the Northampton one was. Yeah, but we played Boston and New York, wow. and there was like, of, of course, the Northampton. Northampton's only like fucking what, like like sixty miles away from Boston. Yeah, something like that. What What are you fucking oh, pointing guys at? Never happy, man. Yeah. Fuck, fuck you. Fuck you and your fucking notes. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that, you know, it, I mean, if anyone that lived in Western Mass like that would have probably driven into Boston. Yeah, to yeah, see yeah. The show, you know, so um, it's kind of weird to have two shows like that. Yeah, that was a great touring cycle. And then two weeks after that, we went to Europe for three weeks and did like festival, uh, festival run runs and a few shows in Germany. And that was a lot of fun. And I think that was the last time I had fun on tour. <laughs> um the European tour was for for Raving Radiant was insanely long. Uh, I think it was like at, at least eight weeks. Oh wow! Give or take that a few long. days. Yeah, it was a long one. No one really seemed happy. I don't. No one saw the sun the entire time. Um, you know, wives and girlfriends were coming and going, and we were spending like it really just kind of felt like it, we weren't not getting along. Like, there was not a lot of fighting or anything like that. You know, there's squabbles here and there, but um, it didn't seem like we were getting along. It just didn't seem like anyone wanted to talk to each other. Uh, the shows, I remember, like, a lot of it was like, oh, I, think, I think it was better last time, you know? Like, I, I don't have one, like, awesome memory of a show that we played on that tour. It's just like this blur of, like, well, we got that done, you know? Um but at that point, you know, Aaron Turner had, had talked to everyone individually of saying, like, look, you know, I'm doing everything to promote Waving Radiant. He's like, I don't want, I don't think I want to make another record. Oh, okay. And, and um, that's why when, like, when I, like, you know, see, like, some things they'll say about ISIS in, in, in an interview, of, you know, when someone's talking to him about for C-Mac, you know, like, I mean, he's not saying anything he didn't say to me, you know, 10, 12 years ago, you know. 
So my hunch was right. I was like, I knew Aaron was in just a different place, and and this wasn't really for for him anymore. And I'm glad, you know, I'm glad we we, we toured on the record and and everything, and just you know, he just wasn't like, oh, fuck you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I, that might have contributed to the weird vibe of like, because in my mind, I was like, this it's definitively over after all this. But I'm not sure everyone else really felt the same way. I think other people thought, well, we'll, we'll do something again. We'll just take like a long break. Um, so that just seemed to be hanging in the air. And then we went to Japan, Australia. And, you know, it was weird. We did, did um, the, the festival in Australia. Clutch played right after us. So we talked to those guys a lot. I remember the bass player being like, we should play shows together. How come we haven't done that before? In my head, I'm like, fuck, I would love to do that. But we're breaking up. <laughs> and, and it wasn't really announced yet. So I was just like, yeah, cool. That would be great. Because it's true. It would have been great. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we, we come back from Japan, Australia. Uh, we got a tour lined up with uh, the Melvins and a tour on the West Coast. And and I come to practice late, and everyone just has a look on their face. And uh, everyone's sitting down, and Turner's like, hey, like, this is what you miss. We're, we're basically, like... You know, I think it was Aaron Harris was like, kind of like, hey, like, what's going on? And Turner was like, I, I, I think I'll, I, I'm done with this. You know, I, I want it to be, I want to be done with this, basically. He was like, ripping the Band-Aid off, you, can, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> well, just, that's how you got to do things. Um, so it was weird, you know, we talked a little bit about it. And it, it was, even though I knew it was coming, it's like, you know, it's, it's sad. You know, we, we put uh, 13 years of our lives into it. But at the same time, it was sad. It was also uh, a little bit of a relief. Sure. I, I wasn't going to, yeah. I mean, I wasn't going to walk into the practice space and leave and feel frustrated anymore or, and think about how this thing kind of got away from what I wanted it to be. Like, I, I said, we wanted it to be more than five guys up there rocking out and they're playing songs. And I wanted it to be more like, like I said, like Swans, Godspeed, they're making statements. There's, um, with their music, we just weren't doing that, you know. It, it became something different. It didn't become anything embarrassed that I'm embarrassed about. For, I mean, I think we went out on a fairly strong record. I think we made the be- Wavering Rating is the best record we could have made at the time. I like that record a lot, actually. I think it's a very diverse record. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think that, you know, like I said earlier in this, I felt like this is kind of like the target. I think the band. Like there was like this end point and it, it does feel like a last album. I mean, similar to, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the band Tar, but they, oh, made, yeah, yeah. they made that record over and out, over and out. Yeah. which is like their, but when you listen to that record and there's something final about that album. And, and, you know, I knew a little bit of the story with Wave and Radiant, but yeah. it's like, a, to me, it felt like this is like a final statement here, you know? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It didn't, I mean, it didn't turn out a hundred percent how I, I, it wasn't totally the direction I wanted to take, but I still, I still am fond of that record. Uh, I, uh, I spent a long time since I've listened to it, but um, I was at work one day listening to the college radio, and uh, uh, Threshold of Transformation came on, and you know I turned, I was like I haven't listened to this in forever, and I listened, I was like this is a f- this is really good, like what a strong song and a strong. Stay, final statement, you know, like just like this is the last song from our last record that people are gonna hear. Yeah. Like, what a great way to end a record. And I was like, we we did all right. <laughs> we did okay. I remember just like listening, like subsequently after the tours that we did together, listening to the records, and it always reminds me of just that that era of being on the road with you guys. And oh like, yeah. You know, I just and specifically there was a show at Emos we played. Um, that it was just, and I was like. Some the, watching you guys play that night, I thought was fucking awesome. And specifically listening to that song makes me think of that night when we all played together down there. That show was all, we always have great shows in Austin. Yeah, but the funny memory from that show is Earth Crisis was playing. <laughs> <in> the, <laughs> That's right. They were Earth playing. Crisis was playing the same club. They were playing like the indoor room. There was like, it was not what well, they. I, I just remember they their their cabs were cut like X's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and right. they. Uh, <laughs> I just, <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of corny. Yeah, and I was like, I didn't even know Earth Crisis was still together, but it, that, was, yeah, that, was, that was a fucking trip, dude. <laughs> but, you know, I revisited this record a few times this week, but I listened to it last night with headphones, and uh, 
It sounded amazing. It's still my favorite album you guys have ever made. And for the first time, it kind of clicked what you guys were just talking about. This sounds like the final statement of yeah. the band. And it, to me, it never connected those dots before. And uh, it sounds like maybe you guys kind of knew it was going to be, well, you knew it was going to be the final record. Yeah, I, At least, knew, yeah I knew in my heart for sure. Um, and Threshold of Transformation has always been my favorite song on the record. I, I think it's an amazing way to end a record. Um, what's cool is that, you know, you guys were charting a bunch of times for the first time. And, you know, you say the shows are getting smaller, but I went to some of those shows. They didn't seem any smaller to me. So, I mean, the turnout still seemed to be good. The record got better reviews than the record before it. So yeah. you guys are one of the few bands that kind of went out on the top of your game. I mean, do you feel that way uh, that you guys did? Or do you feel like uh, you had, you know, the band had more to say and could have improved from there? Mm. No, I don't think we could have made. I think if we continued to make records, it would just, it would have been like we were just spinning our wheels. Like, just like, this is just more of the same. Um, and that's, that, that would have been really just depressing to me. That's always like the, uh, the nightmare, I think, of bands like that are, that are worth anything, really, as to like, continue just to decrease and decline and just make these like pale versions of the stuff earlier, you know, you end up like being like Motley Crue or something like that, you know, and it's like, yeah, embarrassing, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who want, yeah, or, <laughs> who wants, yeah, who wants to go out like that, you know, and I think it's cool when a band just realizes that, okay, this is the best we can, this is like the, the end of the good, the good era you know yeah yeah totally like there's there's bands i even like and, I, and i'm like that, that that put out maybe one or two records too many yeah i mean of course you know it's yeah. like it, 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 like and uh you know the in the beginning we thought isis could be infinite we could always be expanding and changing but that became evident that that was not the case uh, you mentioned that and um yeah yeah i think yeah to continue just would have been a colossal mistake and as far as charting goes, like, there was, like, a weird time where, like, if you sell, like, you know, I think it was, like, 6,000 records, you know, you could chart. Well, it says in the first week <laughs> of the U.S. sales for this record with 5,800 copies. That's week one just in the U.S. That's pretty fucking good for, um, for an indie band. I think week two it sold 200,000 copies, which is really weird. <laughs> <laughs> And then week three, it sold another million. <laughs> <laughs> a million. Um, well, you know, I listen to a lot of music podcasts, too, with a lot of people that are, are in, played in bands that I love and are no longer, you know, making records or playing. So, and I always want this question to be asked, so I'm going to ask it. In 2018, you guys got together to play a benefit for your dear friend, Caleb, from Cave In, Old Man Gloom. Uh, you know, we tragically lost him. You guys hadn't played in a long time. Were there, will there be any more celestial, not ISIS, celestial shows or music? I know it's impossible to answer this question, but I always want this question to be asked. So just from your personal opinion, you're one of the guys, you know. Do you think there'll be any more activity at all? Uh, nope. <laughs> no. Okay, I have to ask. I, I, it's... Uh, it, it was pretty obvious, like, I, at the, the, when we were practicing for the, for, for that show, it felt a, a, a little weird, a little awkward, um, but it came together, and I, I think that's, like, almost the perfect period, end of sentence, like, f for the band. I wasn't really present those last couple shows, like, Maine and, uh... Or Montreal, uh, I just felt like I was somewhere else mentally. Just, but there, like I was completely present, and we were there, and we were together for a great cause. It felt good to play that show. It felt really good, and I, it'll never feel that good ever again. And so that's that's one reason. Like again, like hey, you know, we're, we're doing this for our friend, right. and that that felt great, <laughs> and. You know, at one point I was like, I don't think everyone wants to be here. I don't know if I want to be here. But um, uh, in the end, it gelled. Everyone had fun. Everyone was getting along. 
you know, we were, uh, we had a rented a room to practice in. Uh, we only practiced as the five of us, I think, once. It was me and Aaron Harris a couple times, and me, Aaron, and Mike, then me, Aaron, Mike, and Cliff. And then Cliff was, uh, you know, he was working for a perfect circle, who's, were practicing that in the huge room uh, across the way. So we had one practice where we're like, Cliff was like in the building, but he wasn't practicing with us because he had to work. Um, but, you know, Kaven was there, and the Old Man Gloom guys were, were also there, and 27, you know, Jake and had flown out to do some vocals on on um, Zozo Brasho uh, songs. And we would just kind of we'd hang out afterwards, and it was just fun. It was kind of like weird old times, like look at all these Boston people, and we're all out here in L.A. Uh, doing a good thing for our fallen friend, you know? And uh, another reason is, I mean... Everyone sort of moved on at this point. You know, Turner, uh, I just don't think he's that guy anymore. And I don't think he has any interest in being that guy anymore. And I'm not knocking him, uh, but that's just the way I see it. You know, he's very happy making the music that he 100% wants to make. Why go back and do some things that you feel were maybe a little compromised for you? You know? So, and I'm good with it, you know? Uh, we had a a great run, and I'm sorry to people who, you know, weren't around to get to see us that wanted to, but sometimes you don't get to see the band you want to see, you know, you like, not every band gets back together, you know. Um, if anyone wants to pay me a million dollars to uh, tour, any, get, I'll get like a bunch of scrubs. Um. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Kashid's ISIS. <laughs> yeah, dude. ISIS did, featuring Jeff Kashid. Did, did you ever see that thing that fucking Peter Hook did? Where he toured, right. yeah, he toured like uh, for unknown pleasures. Oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that, but I heard of that. About yeah, it that. was him singing and his son playing bass. Yeah, well. And I'm like, I remember going and being like, this is the most fucking pathetic thing I've ever seen in yeah. my life. I'm not, I'm not one for reunions. Like, I don't really go to see reunion shows per se. It, really. It dep- well, I don't consider the Swans reforming a reunion at all. No, but that's just that's the I don't either. So I mean, it's a it's like a the next. I mean, there's never been. There's been many different lineups in that band, yeah. so it's just like, oh, it's another lineup. Well, you know? they made five albums. Yeah, they made five albums. Yeah. It's not like they just played songs off of, like, Cop or something like that. And, and again, yeah, they just, like, you know, they just picked up where they left off and, yeah. like, created something totally new. But I've also done, I've seen some great reunion shows, and I've seen some not-so-great ones, and, you know, sometimes they do a reunion show and they make an, another album and it's terrible, yeah. you know, and, uh, and Brandy, it looks like you had something to say. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, so if Disturb called, <laughs> <laughs> having turned it down the first time, you know, there's no chance we could see it. That would ISIS be great. Disturb. Yeah. Well, you, you might see the singer for Disturb in my scrub lineup of ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, the Down with the Sickness band, right? Uh, I believe it is. Yeah. That guy's, that guy's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm almost out of notes. Uh, but, uh, you know, you released an album, uh, t- a solo album, technically. I know you had a little bit of help from other people. In 2011, under the name Crone, called Endless Midnight. And I hear that maybe getting uh, released on vinyl for the first time ever soon. So, And that's also on streaming services. There's yeah. still CDs available, if people know what those are anymore. I think tr- through uh, Translation Lost Records. But uh, it's pretty exciting that's getting released on vinyl. I never thought that record got the attention it deserved in 2011 and I think it's a cool record and hopefully people will rediscover it and uh do you have any clue when that's coming out uh I think early 2022 I think we'll see I mean it's probably not a huge priority uh but it it'll 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 exist and uh I'm uh I'm glad for that again it's like a nice period at the end of my uh, of, of my music I hate to say the fucking word career uh yeah, I, I think that coming out on vinyl and like, you know, would be the nice, the end. So, yeah, I'm psyched about that. Thanks for mentioning it. I, <laughs> I would have never brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, thanks for spending time with us. I appreciate it, Jeff. And um, Thanks for paying me to be here, guys. <laughs> like, dude, I really need them. <laughs> <laughs> Things are bad. All right, here's that five I, I owe you. There, <laughs> right, there you go. Randy gave me ten, so. All right, so yeah, fifteen dollars yeah, that cover so your expenses. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. cover my flight out here. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Take care. Yeah.